sensitive and respectful of Native Americans. Uh, what we have learned about Native Americans and what we think we know is often inaccurate or even offensive. But how do we know? Terms such as Indian, totem pole, tribe, pioneer, and costume may seem benign, when in fact there is a larger context of deculturalization and cultural appropriation that needs to be acknowledged and integrated into our discussions. Begin to unlearn and then relearn the First Nation story through a critical analysis of images, history, and words used in the English language. And tonight's presentation is led by Claudia A. Foxtree. Uh, she has a master's in education, uh, who has taught anti-racism and multicultural education courses to teachers, school staff, and at the college level for over 25 years. Claudia is on the board of the Massachusetts Center for Native Americans, and she's the Massachusetts liaison for the United Confederation of Tayano People. Uh, so all uh, 40 of us or so, let's give a big round of applause. Thank you, library. Yep. <laughs> um, thanks for inviting me. Um, I know Michi really well, and I've gone to several Dawnland uh, premieres. I also worked on certain segments of that curriculum guide, which is an excellent guide, free to download online, but enormous, so don't go printing it right away. Um, and I highly recommend coming to that viewing. I'm going to touch upon the boarding schools. The key question in the curriculum guide is how is taking the land related to taking the children? Um, and it's, it is... Uh, chock full of ideas. Before I even get started, I want you to start to loosen up what you know about indigenous people. And so I've given um, everyone a card. If you didn't get one, you can come up here and get another one. There's two colors. There, each color for me is a set of cards. So I distributed two sets. But I'd like you to, if, you, if you're able to, come into the middle here and do a little mingling in when I say go. You're going to read your card have a little conversation about what's on your card, and then the other person, they might have the same question, but likely they'll have a different question. They'll read theirs, they'll say a little about their card, and then we'll do one trade. You trade the cards and find a new partner and have a conversation with what's now your new card. And they'll talk about their new card, and then uh, we'll finish up, and at the end I'll collect the cards. Are the directions clear? Okay, come into the center so you can mix yourself up and find somebody to talk about what's on your card. What was that experience like? What did you notice? What did it bring up for you? What did you notice in your conversations? Any volunteers? Will to be the first? Thank you. Um, you said that it confirmed how ignorant you are. Did anyone else feel like there was a few things they didn't know? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, other thoughts? So you weren't alone. Any other thoughts about it? But that's why I'm here. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. It depends on how old you are. Ah, depending on how old, it, it all depends on how old you are. Yeah certainly changed for different um, eras of our country's history and when we were born. Anything else? Yeah. So I mean, comments on the cards were kind of like oblivious to me. Like I didn't even notice certain things. Can you be more specific? So nobody knows every, every card, but they were questions like, uh, when was your first exposure to a Native American image? What do you remember from television? What do you remember from movies? A whole range of, of media and literature kind of <coughs> questions, especially for this is getting audio vi videotaped so that people know what we just did. <laughs> well, a couple of things. I was kind of oblivious to the mascots that were watching the Lone Ranger of Edward Tonto, but I always thought he was smarter than everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you remember Tonto. From, I, had a, I had a positive image of yep. and the fact that both the Long Ranger respected them, they respected each other, it just it was contrived. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did somebody write something on one of the cards? No. Okay. <laughs> the Long Ranger always said Tonto would get beat up. <laughs> so, this is just to get your 
brain sort of flowing. Um, there's a few things I like to do when I start presentations, and um, that's one of them. Um, another is to involve the audience in doing a um, song. <laughs> We're going to do um, a river song because it has to do with water, and water is um, fresh water is a finite resource on this earth, and we really need to be careful what we do with our water and take care of our water. And uh, the pipelines, that, that, that's one issue that's hit the news. We've known it's been going on for decades, but because it hit the news a couple of years ago, now you all, the greater population, knows about it. And that was about uh, protecting the water, the water protectors as well. So we're going to do this song. Uh, I'm going to be on the drum and we're going to do it as a call and answer song. This is not a song that is, uh, it's not ceremonial, it's a social song, and it isn't in the language, in the tongue of, of any people. It's more of what we'd call um, vocables, like the fa-la-la or tra-la-la parts of songs. And it's inspired by sitting by a river and uh, hearing the songs. But let's just do, before I get on the drum, a, a practice. I'll say it, you repeat after me. Wishy ta do ya do ya do ya. Wishy ta do ya do ya do ya. Wishy ta do ya do ya hey. Wishy ta do ya do ya hey. So when we, uh, we're gonna do the second part in a second, but if we were doing this like for reals in the indigenous community, there would be no words. These are like my version, my English version of the words. Because we're an oral tradition, and it's amazing because when you raise your children and you do these songs over and over and over, like hundreds of times, they learn them. And that's what kids do nowadays, right? They just listen to music over and over, and now they can look up the words. They don't even have to like uh, slur them in any way. So. Um, Kids learn it without this. This mostly helps me um, help you see that there's definite uh, rhythm to it, there's a structure, it's not random. Let's do the second part. Washa tanea heya heya. Washa tanea heya heya. Washa tanea heya hey. Washa tanea heya. All right. We're going to do it with the drum. We're going to honor the water. I happen to know if I stand too close to this, it will be way too loud. So I'd like you to sing it with me. Now that we did a call and answer, you felt it on your mouth, and now we're going to do it together. So as soon as I start, please start with me. Give yourself an applause, uh, round, of, round of applause. What did we just say? Um, this is not vocal. This is vocables. It's not actual language. So this is the sound of the water. It was written sitting next to a river. I do have songs with vocables. They're a little bit harder. I picked water because I wanted to focus on water a little bit. Um, water is life. And it's an important piece that I want to acknowledge before presentation. As you can see here, the Navajo Nation is struggling, so are many other nations. And in this case, it's not um, oil, it's uranium mining. So the uranium mining um, by the U.S. government, because even though the reservation was given um, to the Navajo or Diné people, they are always, when there's something found, the government has uh, some clauses, some rights to be able to come in and say, well, you get all of it except this part, like this oil well or this place where there's uranium mining. And because of that uranium mining and the trucks coming in and out, the air is polluted, the water is polluted, 
they literally have to have water trucks brought into the reserve so that people can have clean water to drink. And for those who think that the reservations don't affect them, those uranium trucks with their uranium dust went up and down highways too. So it isn't, it isn't safe. It's certainly not safe for the Navajo, um, Diné people, and it sheds light on me as a person being here in front of you. I um, own my house, well the bank does, and not a lot of indigenous people are in that situation where I, I can go in my kitchen and turn on a faucet and have clean drinking water and access to water that I can shower in. And in a whole lot of ways, I have a relative privilege of having gone to college and been educated, having um, parents who have been educated in um, the American um, university system. Actually, my mother is German, is Schaffein Deutsche Mutter, and she um, was educated in the German Heidelberg school system. So I have a lot of relative advantages, which makes it possible for me to be here in the suburbs in front of you to be able to talk about um, being an educator and, and teaching. There are plenty of indigenous people who would be up here talking about how they can't hunt, they can't fish, they can't have access to water, the women are dying, the children are dying, all kinds of other reasons that they could be here. I'm here to talk about stereotypes, which makes me in some ways feel like this big compared to the huge issues going on in um, this country and across the world. And in another way, it makes me feel like this because that is directly affecting us in our everyday life and the children in our school systems and what we do. And so my conversation is gonna focus on indigenous people and we have to understand that stereotypes actually affect everybody. So the kinds of things that I'm gonna say are similar with any kind of stereotype. And that's what I was asked to speak about today. There's other things I talk about, but this is the one I'm talking about today. Another acknowledgement I wanna make is that this is indigenous land. The indigenous land of all of the North and South America was originally owned by indigenous land or occupied by indigenous people. And if we look at this map, you can see a whole list on the left of all the indigenous people who were here in Massachusetts, including the Wampanoag and the Nipmuc and many other groups. And then there's a close up map of um, Boston, which um, you can see some, you might recognize something. It doesn't actually say Boston, it says Shawmut. And that's because the original name of Boston was. Um, Shawmut, but you can see Logan Airport and Waterfront and Back Bay as well. The other thing I want to acknowledge is that I'm going to be talking about indigenous people from all over the Western Hemisphere. We are from the top of North America to the bottom of South America, which is the same latitude as Finland through Africa. And while we have a lot of commonalities, we are not exactly the same. And that's important to acknowledge. I'm one person, I'm speaking from my own research, my academic research, and my experience, and my experience of being with other people. Someone else might come here and say something slightly different, but I'm not making things up. I have some research to back it up. And we have a huge variation in how we look and how we behave and what's important to us. We're very, very diverse. You know, there's, there's over 500 recognized indigenous nations. Those are the ones that had treaties. But there's many, many more that just never had the treaties. They had no reason to have them or they were um, decimated before the contact where a treaty would have been necessary. We speak over 200 different languages. And again, we look very different. Speaking of looks, I wore my traditional dress, which we call regalia, tonight. Um, I have a lot of different traditional dress. I wear this one tonight uh, because I wanted you to see that indigenous people don't all look the same in the clothing we wear. And what we wear is not a costume. In the same way, we wouldn't tell this young woman that's a bride that she's wearing a wonderful costume or this, uh, the pope or the priest saying, that's a great costume. Now, in fact, dumping tea into the Boston Harbor was a costume. It wasn't like anybody thought that was real Indian people doing that. They all knew it was the Sons of Liberty on that boat dumping off the tea off the edge of it. And why did they wear those outfits? Well, there's a great book called Playing Indian. I have a slide later of some books that um, 
you might want to get and read. And it, it talks about how the idea of dressing up makes you pretend to be someone else. That's what a costume is. If you wear it when you're not being yourself, when you're playing uh, in a play, or when you're dressing up for Halloween, or in this case, dressing to dump tea and do something illegal uh, at the time. So there are, there's a whole book about multiple reasons why people might dress up. Uh, I want to point out that we wear regalia, and it looks very different than everyone else's regalia. There's a great um, TED talk by Chimamanda Adichie called A Single Story, and I have a couple of quotes of hers throughout here, because I think that she really hits on the idea of stereotypes, that a single story creates stereotypes, and the problem with stereotypes isn't that they're untrue, but that they're incomplete. So I hope to fill in some of those gaps, but I couldn't possibly fill in 500 years of gaps or our own decades of gaps in our own education here in the United States. <clears throat> so there's this professor out of uh, Pennsylvania State University, and he did a study of uh, the big three news stations over a 10 year time period. And during that time, he found that there were 175,889 news stories. Um, of those combined total, 98 were about Native Americans. So you might um, be wondering why is that a big deal? Well, if no one else is telling our news stories here in the United States, where else would that be happening? And now because I'm German, I like to pick on the Germans, I wouldn't go to Germany and say, you need to be telling the indigenous people of the Americas stories and news. You know, that's not, that doesn't make sense. However, this is the United States. This is part of our history. This is happening here. So the fact that there were only 98 stories is quite problematic. The majority of these stories were framed by stereotypical 18th century images such as Native Americans in buckskin clothing, riding horses, and wearing traditional headdresses. Uh, the least common type of story was that representing 21st century Native Americans in a positive light. Most Americans believe that Native Americans are either assimilated or extinct. We don't exist anymore. If you walk out of this door with no other thing from here, walk out knowing that we're still alive. In fact, 80% of us live off the reservation, 78% to be exact, according to the last census. That's only 22% that still live on the reservation. Now, there's a lot of reasons that happen, not all of them good, um, and there are a lot of people who are multiracial. We've been mixing for 500 years, and depending where the group came in on the United States, that's who we ended up mixing up with. So um, there's a long history of being a multiracial people and existing. The real question is, are you existing and still connected to your heritage, which is the harder thing to do. Uh, Beverly Daniel Tatum uh, wrote a book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? She is um, retired now from Spelman College. She was one of my uh, professors early on in this work, so I really appreciate the things she has to say. And this um, is one key quote that I want you to, to hear. The dominant group assigns roles to the subordinate that reflect the latter's devalued status, reserving the most highly valued roles in the society for themselves. To the extent that those in the target group internalize the images and the dominant group reflects back to them, they might find it difficult to believe in their own ability. So that's really about stereotype threat. Claude Steele did a lot of work on that. And so one aspect of stereotypes that is that I'm not going to focus on, I want you to have in the back of your head, because I'm really going to focus on how this affects all of us, is that it really affects indigenous people who then don't see accurate images reflected back, don't see an entire continuum of images and ideas of what it means to be indigenous reflected back. And I'm going to go over some of the stereotypes. I'm not going to hit them all. I'm just going to hit some of them. The first is that Native Americans were primitive. And this is, this is a stereotype. And I have a just a little example of how we're not, 
Um, and in 1492, the map of the world sort of looked like this. Uh, if you can notice, there's this wide gap of blue between Europe and Sipangu, which is Japan. And there's nothing in between where North and South America would be. Now, tons of people had already known that the, how the circumference of the Earth was in a few uh, miles, if not feet. And the idea that Columbus thought he could go west and left out 3,000 miles and thought he was going to make it to um, Japan just as ludicrous. And he's supposedly a navigator, and so he would know that if you go 3,000 miles, you wouldn't necessarily hit Japan because that's not enough miles to make up the circumference of the Earth. Uh, but the real reason that I wanted to show that is also for a timeline. You can see my fancy stars here. The, on the right, I have Columbus's arrival in 1492. And I want to backtrack to 2000 BC when the Mayan civilization was in existence. They were not primitive. Mm -mm. In fact, they had books, libraries, uh, they were codices, sort of like folding books, it's more complicated than that. And when um, the Spanish conquistadors arrived, the first, one of the first things they did after they took over and learned the lay of the land, which is a story in itself, is destroy all the libraries and all the books. So it might seem like there was no um, written text, but there's a reason that we don't have that, because it was immediately destroyed. We also have um, the Aztec civilization in 1325, and pretty concurrent with Columbus, we have Inca. And these are all huge. There were, there were many others, Mississippian, there were other groups. The idea that we were primitive, which I'm hoping by the end of here you're going to see there's a lot of other ways we weren't primitive, that we had technology and advancements, all kinds of things, that it does not make us primitive. And going along with the idea of being primitive is that we were savages. Uh, Again, here is some woodcuts from uh, around the 1500s, shortly after uh, Columbus had started to come to the um, Caribbean. He didn't know he was in a new continent, supposedly. So uh, woodcuts were how things were printed really quickly and the information was spread. And when he came, the question is, who was the savage, right? So look at these images. He said, if you discover that some among them steal, you must punish them by cutting off nose and ears, for those are the parts of the body which cannot be concealed. So I only picked one slide here. There's a great book, The Devastation of the Indies, by Bartolome de las Casas. He was a um, uh, religious person who was on the ship with Columbus. So his accounts are the actual primary source for this time period. We actually have a way more about this time period than we do for a hundred or so years later for Plymouth, um, Plymouth contact. So it's kind of interesting because we have his accounts and he lists over and over the atrocities of what Columbus physically did or ordered his soldiers to do to the indigenous people. Another stereotypes is that um, Native Americans get help or handouts from the government. So I put in a slide to um, show the um, health system and the racism in the health system because we have, we have not gotten adequate health care, reservations and off reservations. And with so many issues, look at these percentages, 530%, you know, more than the um, dominant culture or the culture around us, there's no way that we're getting even equal treatment in healthcare. You know, if we were, we wouldn't have this high of statistics of the devastating things that are happening among the people. This is a um, 2014 report. And I'll go on to say that Native Americans often receive educational benefits like reduced uh, tuition grants like other historically disadvantaged people and disabled war veterans, just to name a couple of them. But the special treatment is not special treatment at all. Usually it's an agreement that still stands today from those earlier uh, treaty rights when the government took the land. So by giving Native people the education and monetarily 
quote, advantages. They're simply fulfilling their legal contracts in exchange for the cessation of lands. And they aren't always fulfilling those contracts either. As the saying goes, there isn't any treaties that haven't been broken. So there's another stereotype that Native Americans are alcoholics. In reality, the largest group that's alcoholics is not Native Americans. Um, there was a study done on this as well. And it also acknowledges that alcoholism is often associated with poverty, and so it's not un surprising that within one of the most depressed groups of this country that you would see the alcoholism and that it's really hard to break out of the cycle of poverty and therefore the cycle of the alcoholism as well. Another stereotype is that Native Americans have casinos and therefore tons of money. Well, the reality is that only 25% of all Native American um, nations have casinos. Guess who has 75%? <laughs> well, it's not Native people, right? Um, and if you look even closer, on a casino, 25% is Native run, Native owned, and 75% is not Native, other people, like who owns the... Um, mortgages and who supplies and who works in, so that rule of 25 kind of works. I will tell you that when I started doing presentations about 15, 20 years ago, or the last census, um, Native people only had 10% of the casino. So it has doubled, more than doubled, in the decade that I've been presenting. Uh, part of that is because it's one of the only ways that Native people are allowed to make money or can make money, just like we look at certain industries and you see some racial groups more represented than in, say, another industry. And this happens to be one. And you also have to think that there's like over 500 casinos, only half of them, uh, there's 500 nations, only half of those nations have casinos and some of them have more than one casino. And reservations are notoriously not on good land. Not only not on good fertile kind of land, but not on good lands near highways and near cities and near populations. So you have to go really far out of your way to get the casino so they're not all real popular. It happens at the Pequot one near us is, and it is in a city, and it has all those other advantages. But that's really an outlier for the whole experience of casinos. And then when the um, nations get the money, they get to decide how they're going to um, deal, deal with that as well. You know, sometimes they divide it up among the nations, sometimes they put it back into the infrastructure for elder housing or youth programs and that kind of thing. And I want to just reiterate, there's a lot more to each one of these history that I just am not going to be able to get into. So there's another stereotype, a couple of them here, three, that Native American stories aren't not important, that we're liars, and that um, we lost, we're the losers in history. So again, I'm going to um, go back to Chimamanda Adichie. She says, it's impossible to talk about a single story without talking about power. How they are told, who tells them, when they are told, how many stories are told are dependent on power. So here is an image of um, Native American boarding schools. This uh, is a before and after kind of picture. The boarding school system took indigenous children from um, very young, could be four or five, and brought them thousands of miles away, like from Canada into Pennsylvania. Uh, to these military institutions of boarding schools. Has anybody ever heard of the Native American boarding school system? Okay, so that took the kids away over, overnight boarding for the nine, 10 months of a school year and then they returned to their nation. They couldn't communicate because they were forced to not speak their language. They didn't know all the cultural practices because they didn't have them and they were told not to do them. They couldn't fish or help in the community because they hadn't learned all of those traditions that they would have learned if they'd stayed in the community. And parents didn't get to raise their children. So there was a huge um, gap in being able to pay, pass on cultural knowledge. You could think of it, um, it is, culture and religion are not the exact same, but think of it as you're teaching your child your 
preferred religion or no religion, and then someone takes them and says, well, we're going to teach you this religion and then send them, send them back. You know, those are the kinds of things we can't even imagine happening. Does anybody know when the boarding school system finally ended and indigenous kids were not taken from their families again? Sort of a trick question, but I want to ask it that way. Does anybody know? What did you say? It was in the 70s. It was 1978, Jimmy Carter signed the Indian Child Welfare Act, ICWA. Uh, this is what the Don Land movie is, takes place after the signing of this. So I know you hear about it has to do with boarding schools, but it's really about Don Land. What happened after the boarding schools is since you couldn't do the boarding schools anymore, something else start, came about, which was the foster care system, which continued to take children away from their families. Um, it's still continuing up to this day. The, and some states have a worse reputation. Minnesota, I think, does it to 22% of their indigenous people. So children are being taken away from their family. In 1978, the official policy of boarding schools ended. Um, in 1978, the other law that he signed was religious freedom for indigenous people. Before that, we couldn't worship or practice or do anything with our religion publicly. That included dancing, singing, any other aspects of it, and the healers and medicine people were put in jail. This is not that long ago. I was in eighth grade. I'll tell you how old I am. Um, so to think that this was so long ago they're all dead is just another fallacy of the stereotypes not passing on accurate, complete information. I, I, I could have picked um, a few different presidents, but not a lot, because a lot of presidents don't write anything really relevant in their Thanksgiving speech or in their November Native Heritage Month. But I have this one as it sort of sums up the um, the issue associated with this particular stereotype that um, we're all dead and that kind of thing. For far too long, the heritage we honor today was disrespected and devalued, and Native Americans were told their land, religion, and language were not theirs to keep. We cannot ignore that these events, we cannot ignore these events or erase their consequences for Native people, but as we work together to forge a brighter future, the lessons of our past can help reaffirm the principles that guide our nation today. So no, another stereotype that exists is that the first Thanksgiving was a peaceful gathering in 1621 between pilgrims and Indians. How many people have heard that story? I'm not saying you believe it, just saying yeah, if you heard it, okay. Because some people who are new to this country don't know that story, and I sometimes have to explain that story. Um, but that's the story, and I call it a story because it is a story. There's a, another long history related to that story that involves John Smith of Pocahontas. Um, it involves King Philip from the uh, King Philip Wars. There's a lot more to it. What I'm going to share with you is one of the two primary sources we have from Thanksgiving. The other one just has food in it, so I didn't include it today. Uh, but this one is all we really know of maybe that event. Um, there was a ship called the Fortune, which carried letters back and forth between the pilgrims and the folks who were they left, and family friends they might have left back there. Um, the ship pirates came into the ship. They took the letters again. All these great stories. The um, two kings of the different countries had to petition each other to get the letters. Anyway, they got the letters. It eventually was published in Mort's Relation, and this is what it says. Many of the Indians coming amongst us and among the rest of the, the among the rest, their greatest, King Massasoit, with some 90 men, whom for three days we entertained and feasted, and they went and killed five deer, which they brought to the plantation and bestowed on our governor and upon the, the captain and others, and although it was not always so plentiful as it was at the time with us, yet by the goodness of God we are far from want that we often wish you partakers of our plenty. Because when they're writing a letter, they're not going to say, it's freezing here, we hardly have any food, half our people died, I'm sorry we did this. That's not what the letters are like. They're all sort of happy, things are great, when that's really not what's happening, but that's what the letters look like. It's not officially proclaiming Thanksgiving. It's not calling it Thanksgiving. It was probably, um, the, the experts in this field, it was probably a diplomatic mission. They were happy, the pilgrims, and they were shooting off their guns, and Massasoit came with 90 of his warriors. 
and said, why are you shooting off guns? And they said, we're excited about the harvest. And they said, oh, well, you don't have enough food for us. We'll go out and get some deer. And you know, they probably rolled out from there. They didn't bring any women. And in fact, the pilgrims considered indigenous native people as heathens. And you would never do a religious um, ceremony, which is what they considered their thanksgivings, with heathens in the first place. So the, the whole idea doesn't even fit that time frame. There were officially proclaimed Thanksgiving. You can look them up. Uh, there were many of them uh, around this time, because this is the, uh, pilgrims are not the first colony here in the United States. Jamestown existed, a whole bunch of others existed. It's 1622. Um, Boston is incorporated in 1635. The pilgrims arrived in 1620. So there's, there's already been a lot of colonization going on and official declarations. Every single officially declared Thanksgiving is for murdering indigenous people. We declare a Thanksgiving that our Warriors have come back safely after massacring 700 Pequot. That's the one in 1630, I think it's 16, I don't have the exact date, 1635 maybe by Governor William Bradshaw. And they're all sort of like that. So they're pretty bloody, pretty gory. Those are the official Thanksgivings. This is not an official Thanksgiving, but this is an event that people think happened. There's a lot more to the history. And I wanted to give you an idea of what we do know. So we don't actually learn what we need to know. It's not like we pulled, somebody pulled out primary sources and said, what does this tell us about that time period, which is what I just did with you. <clears throat> so the story that we're told about Thanksgiving isn't even accurate. Another stereotype is that uh, by using Native American words, we're honoring and respecting Native people. Not totally a stereotype, but it sort of fits here. And uh, I'm going to do a little thing with you. You're not going to have to say anything out loud, or I'm not going to ask you what you thought of. But we're going to do a little free association. I'm going to say four words. And I want you to imagine either an image, or if it works with words, do a list of what I say. First thing that comes to your mind when I say these words. <clears throat> Winnebago, Pontiac, Sequoia, Redskins. Okay, so when I said Winnebago, did you think of the indigenous people from the Great Lakes area that are now reclaiming their Ho-Chunk name? Camp. <laughs> or did you think of a huge recreational vehicle? Okay. When I said Pontiac, did you think of the Ottawa leader? No, no, a car. He's really, <laughs> or did you think of a car, right? Um, he, he's uh, in, our, in our world of what's a role model, who's a role model, who's not a role model. Role models are the people that helped preserve our culture and fought for our people. They aren't necessarily, while they are heroes and role models, in general, they aren't necessarily specifically to indigenous people. People like um, Sacagawea and uh, Pocahontas helped bridge uh, peace, helped bridge conversations, translators. They aren't necessarily heroes in going like, to the government and fighting for um, native rights. Not that kind of hero. When I said Sequoia, did you think of this multiracial Cherokee man? Oh, you thought of a tree. Um, <laughs> he, it, it, the trees are probably named after him, although for some reason there's some efforts to make that connection less well known. Uh, he is really well known. He was not literate. He couldn't read. But he saw European, white Europeans reading, and he knew that it had some power in it. So he took the entire Cherokee language and put it into a syllabary. For, you, for those of you who don't know what a syllabary is, it's like um, the phonics part of our language. So he took each of the sounds and he made symbols to represent the phonics. And in one generation, the entire Cherokee people were literate. And it's still the language they use today. And doing that with never being literate is quite an achievement. It's not with never having seen what writing could do. But it's still pretty amazing. And so he is a really good role model. So before you call it out, I know when I said Redskins, you thought of the Boston team. <laughs> yeah? 
the owner of the Boston Redskins saw that there weren't a lot of people coming to the game, so he moved to DC. So that name went to DC as well. Here's the problem with Redskins, and I'm saying Redskins instead of our word, just the way that people would say N-word, because it's a really racially offensive term. In terms of racism, Redskins on the like really, really bad end. And the other end might have other ways, maybe those other words we were talking about. Redskins is when you go to your local uh, trading post and you bring in your beaver pelt and your bear fur and your redskins. And your redskins are the scalps of indigenous people. It's the scalps because carrying around an entire dead body got cumbersome. Uh, there's been, these are just two bounty proclamations that illustrate you could get 200 bucks for uh, bringing in Penobscot person and 250 for the scalps in Arizona. Um, down in the old uh, Boston State House, the Phipps Treaty also had Penobscot scots but you know piling up dead bodies didn't work really well so it went down to scalps so redskins are the scalping that's going on there could be other words of what redskin means and it also means that it's right here in some primary source documents <laughs> of what it is so it isn't something that we want to be um, proud of you know again the people who have the power are the ones that are telling the story and the stories are incomplete that's what makes them stereotypes Another stereotype is that mascots are honoring Native Americans. <coughs> Matika Wilbur is a photographer, and she's kind of doing what uh, Edwin Curtis thought he was doing. He's got that big sapia tone coffee table edition of photographs of indigenous people, and given that we don't have any other photographs, those are the photographs that get used. But even when he went across country, he thought people didn't look indigenous enough. They looked too European, so he uh, would open his trunk and say, can you put this on and can you put this on? And he sort of dressed people up as he went across the country as well. She doesn't do that. She um, takes photos of folks in regalia, out of regalia, and she also did um, some research during um, a time period from 1990 to 2000 about blockbuster films. There were 5,868 films of that fit that category. Of all those films, 12 included Native Americans. All showed us spiritual and in tune with nature. That's a stereotype. 10 showed us impoverished or beaten down by society. 10 depicted Native Americans as continually in conflict with whites. So again, our stories aren't told in the media. When we don't have the stories, we hear words like Winnebago and Pontiac, and it can't be honoring because it's not even connected anymore to indigenous people. So you don't even think of indigenous people when you hear those words. Even the word Massachusetts is a native word. Um, so is Lake Quinsigamon. Those aren't the words I'm talking about. Those are still the thing that they were named originally. So if you look around, a lot of your streets and, and mountain ranges and things have indigenous names. More than half of the country states are indigenous words. So she um, did this research about the films and now is doing the photography project, which she calls 564, which is how many nations are federally recognized. And she is going across the country recording again the stories, writing them. If you ever get a chance to see her exhibit, it's pretty cool because you see the photographs and the audio is playing of her interviews in the background. So the problem with mascots isn't just the mascot. So we need to think broader than that. It is the images, the chants, and the actions like tomahawk chopper, dancing on the sidelines. It's all those other parts as well. So when I need, say mascot, I'm inclusive of all the things that come associated with it. The, the dressing up, the using of the imagery, um, the lack of understanding of history, the lack of understanding of words. I just picked a few images here. This young woman who's wearing the headdress, that headdress isn't even an East Coast thing. So when it shows up here, it's like, what? Um, that headdress is a Western thing, and every feather is earned. It, it, something that warrior did something to earn a feather. It's such a big deal that even at an indigenous native event, if, a, if an eagle feather hits the ground, everything stops, and a whole ceremony to retrieve that feather off the ground happens because it represents a fallen soldier. <laughs> 
or fallen warrior. So it's, it's very um, symbolic and very meaningful among the people. And it would be like parading around in a, a costume with the medals and badges of honor that we give our own military. It just isn't an appropriate use of it. Um, down below, you can see cheerleaders with, hey, Indians, get ready for the Trail of Tears. Um, I don't know who allowed that or thought it was funny, but the Trail of Tears was a time period during Andrew Jackson's presidency where f about 4,000 um, indigenous people from uh, Georgia area were marched in the middle of winter across the country to Oklahoma for resettlement and every fourth person died. So that would be sort of like saying something just equally horrendous like, um, you know, get ready for the gas chambers or something like that. It's, again, totally inappropriate and not something that you would want to do at a football game. Uh, there's also a comparison between the um, Chief Wahoo and the racist imagery in um, black history that is no longer used, but for Native people it continues to be used. So one way we can look at whether this is a problem or not is to find comparative examples. As it turns out, this past October this image was retired and it is no longer going to be used. They kept the name so far, but they did retire the image. Another problem with um, these kinds of mascots as image, images are the other things that sort of get associated with it. Here you can see this headdress. The symbol in the conch, which is like by his ear, is the picture next to it. Um, the idea of party like a pilgrim, drink like an Indian. The uh, cigar store. Do you know why there's a cigar store Indian? What is the connection? Does anybody have an idea? Tobacco, a native word, and a native invention. We used it for prayer and still do. It's still very um, symbolic. It isn't necessarily smoked. It is burned. So these are just some um, other products that use, that are not indigenous products and do use indigenous name. So more people see stereotypes than authentic images. You know, in the white European movie industry, news industry, again, you got a whole continuum. You have maybe Homer Simpson and um, the All in the Family guy, I can't think of his name, you know, on one end, and, and you have other, you know, totally appropriate, wonderful people on the, on the other extreme. And you've got everything in between. So the, it's not like we're going to judge the white European culture just based on this cartoon character of Homer Simpson, because we've got a lot of other images. That isn't the case for indigenous people. We got Thanksgiving, Columbus Day, uh, sports teams, you know, these little like punch outs in our continuum and nothing else, really. So that's what makes the, the uh, having only the stereotype so problematic. On the other hand, sometimes people notice that there's a problem <laughs> and they change. So the Argo corn maiden, I have to go to the grocery store and see what the latest box is like. You know, she used to be on the whole thing. Now that makes sense because it's corn starch and corn is indigenous and she's getting smaller and smaller. So I would always put up the land, the lakes because we didn't have cows. We didn't have any big animals like that. So I don't understand the connection, maybe wholesome, natural, I don't know. Um, and that's the original image. And just a couple weeks ago, I was in the grocery store and look at the box. The entire body is gone, which is a good thing because I'll leave it to your imagination, but you can Google it. The box would be cut apart to make a um, sexy Indian, a sexy maiden. So they probably got wind of that finally after all these decades and have changed the image so that her knees are no longer in the picture. Um, it's still a problem and you have to decide where your line is. We can't do everything for every group all the time continuously. I don't buy Land O'Lakes butter, but I can't tell you that the croissant I had this morning wasn't made with Land O'Lakes butter. I could if I had a different line 
But everybody has to decide what their line is and make the choices as often as you can. So I do live in Billerica. I have met with the superintendent. And they continue to have this image. And they're going to have it in the new school, too. When they finally have an opportunity to restart fresh without a racist image, they're still keeping it. This is not who we are. It isn't respectful. And you may be able to find a few folks that, indigenous folks, that say it's better than nothing. 90%, maybe 99% will agree that it really isn't better than nothing. You know, all the surveys that have been done, there are other issues facing indigenous people. Mascots might not be their number one if they're looking at fresh water or land or tribal rights or a whole bunch of other things. It might not be the number one thing that's important, but it is the number one thing that's going to affect non-native people, right? That's what they're going to see, that stereotype. There is research on that stereotype, and the research shows that Communities that have racist mascots see Native Americans more negatively. It's an implicit bias study. That means you don't know that that's how you're thinking about it. So they've done the study. That it was actually done across the entire country. And people who didn't have the mascots rated Native people more positively than people who did have the mascots. And that's not just Native people. So how do we want to raise our children? Our children? And how do we want to raise the next generation to think about the indigenous people of this country? Those are the kinds of questions we need to be asking each other. Not how long this tradition has stayed, and what makes this tradition more important than thousands of years of history and culture that is never talked about. <clears throat> By using Native American cultures and ideas, we're honoring and respecting them. So the idea that that's respectful. I'm going to come back to Beverly Daniel Tatum. Even when firsthand experience is limited by social segregation, the number and variety of images of the dominant group available through television, magazine, books, newspapers provide marginalized groups with plenty of information about the dominant culture. That's that big continuum. However, Dominant access to information about the marginalized is often limited to stereotypical depictions of the other. So here are some uh, screenshots. I was just floating around in 2010 of completely inaccurate stories of indigenous people on these little games that kids are playing. You've got um, Columbus's ships mixed with the um, Thanksgiving idea and a teepee on the um, East Coast, just to quickly point out some of the issues. If you Google um, indigenous people or indigenous people clothing, here you go. So this is not honorable. Again, seeing stereotypes more than authentic images. And I like this little cartoon, the idea that there's only one kind of Indian. Well, you don't look like an Indian because all that's in the mind of a non-indigenous person is those stereotypes. Unfortunately, that's often that's all in mind of an indigenous person too. And it isn't like the story is getting told in school or in the media or in the news, as research shows. So in a, in a nutshell, this image really captures the issue. It was OK for these kids to pretend to be Indians, but it was not OK for these kids to actually be Indians. So there's a stereotype that we're spiritual, wise, sun-worshipping, tree-hugging, dancing, storyteller. You know the stereotype I'm talking about. Um, and that women always have a papoose on their back. If you don't believe that stereotype, go to a store and try to get an indigenous doll. They almost always have a little baby attached to it in some way. Native Americans don't exist anymore. Again, leave here knowing that we still exist. I have a couple of examples of how we exist. Here are some real indigenous women. Um, does there anybody not know somebody on this list? Wonder who this person is? Uh, maybe um, Ashton Locklear. She was the first alternative for the women's gymnastics team in Sochi, the, uh, Sochi Olympics. Right, so these are um, actors, Mrs. America, singers. Uh, Irene Bedard was the voice of Pocahontas. She's been in hundreds of indigenous movies and cartoons. Um, Winona, Winona LaDuke ran on the Green Party with Ralph Nader for vice president. Lots of people. So um, 
And I just remind you of this little cartoon that I showed, that, uh, and back one here. You know, you don't look like a real Indian. That's a real problem, especially if you're trying to grow up in an indigenous community. If you're growing up in an indigenous community and the community accepts you and then you come off and peep out of the community, like into the schools and get told, well, you don't look like an indigenous person. I mean, that's like being told, well, you don't look Jewish, so you must not be Jewish, right? You don't look Catholic, so does that mean you're not Catholic? Or, you know, I say I'm German, I am. You don't look German. You know, are you calling me a liar? Who's a liar now? That's really an offensive kind of question, and those would be in the category of microaggression. Microaggressions are when stereotypes become verbalized, and underneath a microaggression is some kind of a stereotype. I give you that because this is me with my children, and you may notice that they don't all look like me. You know, we, they have different hair colors, some are blonde, some have blue eyes, uh, this is them when they're younger and as they got older in their regalia at, at um, different Native American events. I have three girls and two boys. They're not necessarily in all the pictures, but uh, one, it's been hard and we're constantly working at reclaiming and owning our culture, our religion, and language. There's been a lot of work at trying to take that away from us. Um, so there's some stereotypes that Native Americans are warriors with weapons. Uh, one of the powwows that I, which is a Native American social event that I went to in September, uh, one family, friend of a friend, was afraid to come because they were afraid they were going to be shot with bows and arrow arrows. Because all they know is the stereotypes, right? So that's another problem with the stereotypes. When kids danced around my son when he was in high school going woo woo woo, that wasn't because they had watched Peter Pan the night before. That's because that's all they knew, and they had watched it when they were five years old, not when they were in high school. But that's all that sticks, because that's all there has been. I wanted to show you a picture of a real Native American warrior. This is Lori Pistra, Piestra, from She's Hopi. And she was the first woman in the US Armed Forces killed in the 2003 invasion of Iraq. You may remember her fellow soldiers, Shoshona Johnson and Jessica Lynch, who sustained injuries during that time. Of the nearly two million women enlisted in the US Armed Forces, 18,000 are American Indian women, and their representation in the military is disproportionately high. Given that we are 2% of the population in the United States, and indigenous people worldwide are only 5% of the population, to give you a comparison, uh, farmers, are 3% of the population. Uh, we have the highest representation in all military involvements in this country because after all, it's our country too. It's our land. Every single war that this country, this land has been involved in, indigenous people have been there in high representation. Uh, in addition, Native women are more likely to be sexually harassed, which increases their chances of developing post-traumatic stress disorder when coming out of the military. Another stereotype is whatever it is, it's not that big a deal. So remember I said a good strategy is to think of another image or something that's similar to see, would, am I, do I think it's offensive when it happens to this group? You know, do I think um, Trail of Tears is offensive when I think of it happening to a Jewish group with a different, you know, think of that. Another way to think of it is to, um, to flip it. It may, not, it may not exist, but just to flip it. And so I'm gonna give you an example. Here's the original Massachusetts state flag seal, which there's a, there were a lot of them. I picked a, just a couple, one here to show you. Um, the emphasis is on uh, the idea of missionaries coming with the intention of uh, changing the religion of the, or bringing the religion, a different religion to indigenous people. And the words say, come over and help us. Not like we needed help, but that's what it says because Someone else is writing our story. We don't have control over our own narrative. Even if you go to colleges, women's studies will have women. <laughs> uh, but a Native study doesn't necessarily have Native Americans. Here's the current Massachusetts flag. It says, by the sword we seek peace, but peace only under liberty. And if you think that's nice, think about convert to my religion or I'll kill you. 
because that's sort of what it translates to. And if you can't get the image, let me flip it for you. We seek peace, but peace under liberty. Right? Being reversed, I think you can get the visual that this flag is not complementary to indigenous people. There is a bill in the House to change it currently. So what now? How do we bring the native story up to date? Well, we need to understand that stereotypes are damaging. They misrepresent history and culture. They're not the real authentic images. A single image gets assigned to all indigenous people. Stereotypes are negative by nature because they don't focus on contributions, role models, or resistance. The songs and dances that are taught are not our songs and dances. I mean that other stuff that goes with the mascots, those other kind of dances. The images affect everyone, not just indigenous kids. And that our photographers, our musicians, our teachers, our actors, our politicians, our lawyers, our, everybody is missing from the story. We can't do everything. We have control of over a teeny, if you, you got a slice here. The point is what we have control over, just a little bit. We can probably influence our families maybe, and we can concerned about a whole lot. But the more people we connect with, the more slices of this pie that we get. So I suggest that you be honest with yourself, check your language, step outside your comfort zone. Thank you for being here today. Educate others about stereotypes, be an ally, read history, that was missing in your education and attend events. So this is my book list. And I've got just my favorite books. I've read a lot of books. These are my favorite books and only one of them is written by a non-native author. Um, so why read about the past? Some people will say we need to understand our past or we'll be contemned, condemned to repeat it, that, that piece of it. I see it as if we don't learn about our past, we can't understand the present. So I have some images here, which I can't go into every one of them. But these images can't be understood if we don't understand the past that got us here. So why are people angry? Why are people protesting? Why is this man crying? If we don't understand our history as a country, and I don't mean our as me as an indigenous person, I mean our United States history, we can't understand what's happening today. So yeah, we might repeat things, but we're totally gonna make stuff up if we don't know how we got here. Here is um, an event that you can attend. It happens every year since the 1970s. Why so late? Why the 70s? Well, it wasn't until 1978 that we got a whole bunch of other right, rights, but it wasn't until the late 1960s that the Civil Rights um, Act was passed. And based on the Civil Rights Act, other groups were working on their civil rights. That's why it's the 70s, because that's when indigenous people started doing indigenous civil rights. And at noon on Coles Hill, which is the big hill right in the middle of Plymouth, there is a gathering that lasts about an hour or two, but get there early because it's crowded. And you can hear about current indigenous events, uh, experiences, what's happened in the past year. Um, before we close, I have a little game, so I understand if you have to leave, but I do have a little game. It won't take that long. And I wanted to leave you with um, two quotes. We won't have a society if we destroy the environment, Margaret Mead. And look and listen for the welfare of the whole people and have always in view not only the present, but also the coming generations, even those whose faces are yet beneath the surface of the ground, the unborn of the future nation. We um, look forward, we do this work not for us, not necessarily for our children. This is a long-term plan. We often think seven generations ahead. Will there be an earth? Will there be justice? We're thinking ahead. <laughs> <laughs>